after the optic disc changes what is the other important thing that we are coming across so the third important thing which is important in the assessment of the glaucoma is your visual field effects and i think this is the most interesting part also the visual field effects so this will be your number c now can you see uh, in your uh, screen i have tried to devise a unique mnemonic uh, for the sequence of the visual field effects which are taking place in the primary open angle glaucoma in this covid times in the corona it is in corona bearing of the patients should be done cautiously to treat in corona is isopter contraction b for bearing of blind spot p paracentral scotoma s is the sidel scotoma then we have b that is gerum scotoma gerum scotoma is the same as the arcuate scotoma then d d is a double arcuate scotoma cautiously see central loss of vision and two means the tubular vision and finally is the treat temporal island also lost right so suppose i ask you what is the earliest visual field defect so what is the earliest visual field defect isopter contraction or enlargement of the blind spot or it is sidel scotoma or it's arcuate scotoma so first is your the isopter contraction but you have to be very very careful suppose i ask you a question the earliest visual field defect which is visually significant which is visually significant also then your answer is not isopter contraction right then your answer will be the para central scotoma then the answer will be the para central scotoma so these two questions look similar but they are quite different and the answer is also different now let us try to see how the visual field defects are happening first of all what is a visual field visual field the total visual field is a isopter the total area of the vision the maximum that you can see superiorly the maximum that you can see inferiorly nasally and the temporally so for this you have to remember s nit means 50 degree then 60 degree 70 degree and 90 or 100 degree so maximum we can see in the temporal degree while uh, temporal field while the minimum we can see in the superior field there is a limited field superiorly there is a limitation nasally there is a limitation inferiorly but it is the temporal area where i can see the maximum right now see when i say what is total visual field i told you that it is the isopters can you see they are different isopters so a number of isopters are present in the visual field so all of these are actually the isopters and can you see they are representing the different degrees 10 degree 20 degree 30 degree 40 so this is your horizontal raphe and one is your vertical axis so when i talk about the fields fields are always uh, as if the patient is standing like you so your right will be patient's right visual field and your left will be the patient's left visual field so that there is no confusion in this okay then we have got something called as the blind spot this blind spot is actually lying between 10 to 20 degree area in the arcuate area and this is the area of the optic disc margin where the optic uh, disc is starting so you have a vacuum there so no image is formed therefore this area is called as the blind spot okay now let us try 
to see the distribution of the retinal fibers because basically it is these distribution of the retinal fibers on which these visual field defects are depending. So, let us try to see this. See, this is the blind spot. Okay. Now, we know that blind spot is due to the this blind spot is due to the optic nerve head and optic nerve head lies nasally. So, therefore, therefore the blind spot will be lying because the optic nerve head is in is lying in the nasal nasal retina nasal part of the retina therefore it will represent the temporal field so this first of all idea should be very very clear if you see here how it goes on see this is your optic nerve head and optic nerve head is lying in the nasal retina and this nasal retina will correspond to the temporal visual field. Similarly, if you look at the other area that is your fovea or the macula, it is lying in the temporal retina and this temporal retina will make its image in the nasal visual field. So, it is always diagonally opposite. Now, are you getting? So, if you look at the picture here, so your blind spot is always lying in the temporal field and it represents the nasal fibers. Okay, so now what is happening the, on the nasal side, the nasal side because this is your optic disc, so it will represent the blind spot in the temporal field. So we have got uh, fibers which are the radiating fibers. So, these are your radiating fibers which are present in the nasal retina. They are present in the nasal retina. These are the radiating fibers, superior radiating fibers and the inferior radiating fibers. While if you see the temporal side, in the temporal side, we have got the arcuate fibers. These are actually the arc like fibers. Can you appreciate this? These are also the arc like fibers, something like this. So, these are the arc like fibers called as the arcuate fibers. These arcuate fibers are lying in the temporal retina. Okay, now don't get confused between the retina and visual field. I told you the temporal retina will represent the nasal visual field and this nasal retina will represent the temporal visual field. So, that is very, very clear. And then meanwhile, I have got uh, another fibers which are actually the straight fibers. Can you see? These are comparatively your straight fibers. So, what are these straight fibers? This is your papillo, papillomacular bundle. Papillomacular bundle which are basically the straight fibers, the straight fibers which are present between the papilla and the macula. Papilla means between the optic disc and the macula. So, now what is happening? The arcuate fibers are actually the fibers which are most sensitive to the glaucoma. These are the fibers which are most sensitive to glaucoma and because these fibers are more sensitive to the glaucoma, therefore what is happening now, the temporal retina is affected first and therefore it is a nasal visual field which is affected first and the temporal will be last to be affected. Alright, now see this, there is a, a thing called as 
the arcuate and a double arcuate scotoma and uh, maximum time there is a confusion what is the nasal step. So if you see here we are having this as the horizontal raphe can you see this is the horizontal raphe and then I have this one this is your optic disc right. Now we have got arcuate and double arcuate scotoma. Now see here this is your arcuate scotoma, arc like scotoma. Can you see this is your arc like scotoma? I am making a different color so that you can appreciate. This is your arc like scotoma which is taking place in the different arc. Now when we have the double arcuate scotoma and I have this arcuate scotoma on the other side also. Uh, suppose this. So maybe it is not taking place in the same arc. So now this can take place in the different arc. So due to the difference in the arc, we have got a sharp defect which is formed here. So this is actually called as the nasal step. So I hope this is now very very clear. This nasal step is actually occurring due to the difference in the arcs of the two arcuate scotoma. Both of them are not taking place in the same arc. That is why we have this nasal step. Alright. Now let us see the progression of the visual field defects. The progression of the visual field defects. So one by one we will be trying to see what is happening. Okay. Now actually what happens the first is your isopter contraction. Right. So the first I will write it for you. The first is your isopter contraction. So there is a total contraction of the visual field totally it is contracting and then second is your bearing of the blind spot. So what is happening when there is a constriction of the field in the central area the scotoma which is due to this blind spot is left out something like this. So this is called as bearing of blind spot. Then is a new scotoma which is forming. This is your paracentral scotoma. In the next this paracentral scotoma combines with this one. Can you see this and this will combine and we form this siddle shaped scotoma. Next it enlarges to form this arcuate scotoma. And then we can have a different arcuate scotoma going in the different arcs. So can you see this is arcuate and this is your double arcuate and here <clears throat> this edge that you are getting is your nasal step. This is your nasal step and then what you are left with is just a central vision. You are left with the central vision or the tunnel vision and uh, then even this Tunnel vision is lost and last to go, last to go is the temporal field. Now because this is important, we will try to draw them also. So this is uh, your isopters, right and um, here you can see uh, this is your uh, blind spot, okay. So what is happening in the first one, there is a constriction of the field and it is leaving this blind spot out. So the blind spot has been spared out of your central field. So this will be called as the bearing of the blind spot. Okay, then in the next we have got a new scotoma which is forming this scotoma is called as the paracentral scotoma paracentral scotoma this is the earliest which is significant 
and then what is happening this one and this one are combining so, okay so we are getting a suppose this was your uh, paracentral so both are combining to form a scotoma like this so this is called as the siddle scotoma siddle scotoma next it forms the arcuate scotoma so we have the arcuate scotoma now when you draw the arcuate scotoma see be very very careful how it is going okay so you have to form suppose it is coming in this arc like this and this is going in this arc and it is something like this so this is your arcuate scotoma right this is arcuate Similarly, we can have the double arc weight. Now, this can take place in a different arc. So, suppose this is going like this and it is coming like this. Like this. Right? So, this is called as the double arc weight scotoma. This is your double arcuate scotoma and always remember that this arcuate scotoma is the other name of the gerum scotoma it is also called as the gerum scotoma because you know the arcuate fibers are called as the gerum's area the arcuate fibers 10 to 20 degree this area is called as the gerum area Therefore, if you are having any scotoma in this area, that will be called as the gerum scotoma. It is something like this. Now, slowly and gradually, all this is gone. All this is gone. Okay. And you are just left with a central area of the vision. This is left. And all the other thing is gone. So, you can draw it something like this. Everything has become black here. Everything is gone and just the central vision or the tunnel vision is left, right? So, see here, we have got the tunnel vision here and you are left with a very tiny vision. Everything is gone apart from this, okay? Everything is gone apart from this, like this, 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 this. So, what is this left actually? You are left with the tunnel vision or the tubular vision okay now what is there even this will also go and what is left is this central area in the temporal side so this is gone okay this is gone this is gone everything this has also gone so in the last you will be left with a very small vision and that too on the temporal side because that is the last to go. So you are left with this amount of vision on the temporal side something like this. So I can say that last to go is the temporal field last to go is the temporal field and this question was directly asked in NEET 2018 also a very very important question now let us try to see some of the principles of perimetry because again it is important perimetry is the visual field charting right so we have got two kind of perimetry Static perimetry and kinetic. Static means the object is fixed. If you are doing uh, the perimetry and the object is fixed, then it is called as a static perimetry. This is basically used for the glaucoma. We are using the static perimetry. Well, second is your kinetic perimetry where we have a moving object. So, if I have a moving object, which is coming from a non-seeing area to a seeing area, then that is called as a kinetic perimetry. And this is more commonly used for the neuroophthal. Neuroophthal. Okay. Now, we can see the types. Like, 
uh, in the kinetic perimetry we have got the Lister's perimeter though we are not using this Lister's perimeter now but uh, you should know the names Lister's perimeter then we use the Jerem's tangent screen okay and uh, then we have got the Goldman's Goldman's perimetry. Now Goldman will be present on both the sides. Here also we have Goldman's and here we are also using the Humphreys field analyzer. Humphreys field analyzer, right? This is your HFA and basically it is a kind of automated perimetry. It is a kind of automated perimetry. Now let us try to see if you see the different kinds of the visual field testing like we have a confrontation method. Confrontation method is a bedside method. So I will show you this. Jerem's is your kinetic, Goldman's static plus kinetic both and Humphreys is your automated. This is your automated perimetry, right? And there are two things important, the two strategies that we are using in Humphreys, one is your the Sita and uh, another is the Swap. What is Sita? This is your Swedish interactive threshold algorithm. Well, what is Swap? Short wavelength automated perimetry. So you should know that these are the two strategies that we are using here, right? Now let us see this one. What is this? This is your Humphreys field analyzer, right? And what is the type of uh, chart that you get here? So you should uh, know that this is the chart that we are getting in the uh, Humphreys perimetry. Maybe you don't know how to read it. That is not a problem. But you should know that this is the type of graph that we get from the Humphreys field analyzer. Then second thing Humphreys field analyzer is mainly the static perimetry and thirdly which eye it is. So I told you your right eye will be the right side and your left eye will be the left side. So if my this is my right side so this will be the right eye field and on the left of me is the left eye field. Okay how I am saying this because here I am getting this blind spot. And here also I am getting this blind spot. Blind spot means temporal field. So this temporal field and this temporal field. So the right eye this, field this and left eye field this. Okay. Then see the difference kind. Now this is your what you called as the uh, Jerem's tangent screen. Uh, this is also not very commonly used now but you should know right and this uh, the white dot that you are seeing this is the fixation point the white fixation point right then see this one can you see a goal bowl type so this goal bowl kind of thing that you are seeing this is goldman's so with one which is goal is the goldman's perimeter right and then you can also see this is your confrontation method confrontation method confrontation method is used for the peripheral peripheral visual field charting and also it is a type of kinetic perimetry. So how to do it? This is actually a bedside test that we can do. This is a bedside test in which a patient is confronting the doctor, right? Patient is sitting just in front of uh, the ophthalmologist, right? And uh, the person who is uh, examining 
is considered to have the normal field okay so what we are doing we are closing same side eyes not the same eye same side so if the patient is closing the right eye examiner will close the left eye like this and we ask the patient to look into the other open eye and we'll bring some moving object we'll keep it uh, in the center between the patient and myself and then i'll try to bring it so the moment i start seeing it i'll uh, stop there and we have to ask the patient whether he is seeing or not and we are basically comparing the visual field of the patient with this examiner right coming from the periphery towards the center so it is moving and also it is peripheral then see this the arc like the arc like is called as the lister's parameter not used now this is also not used nowadays so if you look at um, the type of parameters where did it light it was in the kinetic but now it is not used then there is another way of dividing this visual field charting that is your central visual field charting in the peripheral visual field charting central means if i am seeing just 0 to 30 degree periphery means from 30 degree to beyond so this can be done with the help of the campi meter and this is done with the help of the perimeter right now we'll be starting with the treatment of open angle glaucoma as you know that the main therapy is the medical therapy and there are a lot of many questions which are uh, coming from this so i'll try to uh, cover them all so the first which i use are the beta blockers they are the most common most popular and where they are acting actually their mechanism of action is decreased aqueous formation acting on the beta receptors of the ciliary processes which are located in the pars plicata part of the ciliary body now you know amongst this most commonly used is your non selective Timolol. Timolol uh, is basically used 0.5% two times a day, a very good drug. But the main problem is that it is contraindicated in the cardio pulmonary diseases it is contraindicated in cardiopulmonary diseases be it bronchial asthma we have atherosclerosis we have copd right and there are certain um, conditions where you should not uh, use them like uh, the heart conditions atherosclerosis then we have bronchial asthma we have copd congestive heart failure coronary artery diseases and also the diabetes the reason is that it masks the effects of the hypoglycemia so if the patient is having some cardiopulmonary disease and you are not able to use the timolol that what we can use we can use the selective drug the selective drug that is betoxolol that is also acting by decreased aqueous formation but the advantage is that it is increasing the blood flow to the optic disc and therefore it is the drug of choice of the normal tension or the low tension glaucoma then we have got one more drug that is cartiolol this cartiolol is the drug of choice in hyperlipidemias okay and it is a non selective beta blocker okay all right now previously actually beta blockers were drug of choice but now your drug of choice is the prostaglandin f2 alpha analogs and they are working by increasing the uveoscleral outflow we have latinoprost we have bimetoprost we have got trevoprost and there is a long list of the adverse reactions which are occurring due to these prostaglandin analogs the first is that they are causing hyperpigmentation of the iris they are increasing the pigment and therefore if they are used on one side that can cause the heterochromia of the iris then second important thing they can cause a trichomegaly elongation of the eyelashes so even fda has approved its use for the elongation of the eyelashes it can increase the number of eyelashes it can also increase the length of the eyelashes 
Number three, it can also cause the pigmentation in the periocular skin area. You can see darkening. And then because it's a prostaglandin analog, it can cause intraocular inflammation, should not give in in the uh, inflammatory conditions. It can cause reactivation of the herpes simplex, should not give. If there is a previous history of herpes simplex, um, and then we have got the cystoid macular edema, especially in the predisposed conditions like the diabetic retinopathy. And in all these conditions, the beta blockers are preferred and that is why still they are the most commonly used drugs. Then the next is your alpha adrenergic analogs. Now, these are the unique set of drugs which have got double mechanism of action. They are causing the decreased aqueous formation. They are increasing the aqueous outflow, but still not the drug of choice. What's the reason? The reason is their allergic reactions. Tachyphylaxis. Tachyphylaxis is the tolerance to the effect of the drugs if used for a very long time and you have to increase the dosage when you increase the dosage we have more chances of allergic reactions now again we can have two kinds the selective and non-selective and you can easily remember these drugs by a b c d and e a b c is amongst the selective drugs we have aproclonidine we have bremonidine and we have got clonidine in the selective we have dipivifrine and epinephrine Apraclonidine is used basically in the procedures which can cause a raise in trochlear pressure like it can be trabeculoplasty, peripheral aridectomy. Brimonidine is a very good drug which is acting as a neuroprotector. Now because it is a neuroprotector therefore along with the pitoxolol you can also use this drug in the normal tension glaucoma an important point. Now, being a CNS depressant, it can cause apnea, it can cause drowsiness. These are the very frequently asked questions related to bremonidine and therefore it is contraindicated in the infants. Now, if you come to the non-selective drugs, we have got dipivifrine and we have epinephrine. Dipivifrine is a pro-drug of epinephrine. And epinephrine can cause hypertension. So, the, this dipivifrine is also contraindicated in the systemic hypertension. We should not give this drug. Epinephrine can cause a cystoid macular edema, especially in the aphakia. But an important thing is that dipivifrine is a drug of choice in the hypertension uveitis, that is your inflammatory glaucomas. So, if you are having the inflammation along with the raised intraocular pressure, dipivifrine is the right drug. The next class of drugs is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. They are decreasing the aqueous formation. They can be topical, they can be systemic. We have dorzolamide, brinzolamide. In the systemic, we have acetazolamide, we have metazolamide. And this is a systemic drug, acetazolamide, is a very, very commonly used drug that we are using before the cataract surgery to decrease the intraocular pressure. Before the cataract surgery, we are using. So, how much we are using? We are using. 250 milligram tablets, two tablets during the night and two in the morning. Then it can also be used as an emergency drug when we have the acute congestive glaucoma. But this drug should not be used in the patients with the sulfur drug allergy and uh, like we have got another sulfur drug topiramate. There was a question in AIMS November 2. 2019 that which type of glaucoma it causes? It causes bilateral acute congestive glaucoma due to the uh, forward rotation of the iris lens diaphragm due to the uh, ciliary body effusion. So, this is uh, the main mechanism how it is causing the angle closure glaucoma. Then we have got a number of adverse reactions which can occur due to these uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Again, you can remember them with ABCD. We have A for anorexia, we have got B for blood dyscrasias, we have got B for bad taste, C for sickle cell crisis, crisis, D for discomfort, D for depression, hypokalemias, paresthesias. So, there are so many things which uh, can be caused by this. 
right so we have got anorexia bad taste we have got blood dyscrasia crisis sickle cell crisis depression discomfort discomfort is mainly the gi discomfort then finally we come to the hyperosmotic drugs we have orally used glycerol we have iv used mannitol and basically these drugs are acting by causing the decrease in vitreous volume not acting on the aqueous volume and that is why they are not used as a maintenance drugs these are mainly used to uh, in the times of the emergency to shift the volume of the fluid from the vitreous to the ECF and that is why these drugs are contraindicated in cases of the volume overload conditions. Alright, now there is a new class of drugs that can be used and these are your rho kinase inhibitors and we have uh, a drug nitarsudil in this uh, category. Now these drugs are also the anti-glaucoma drugs and they are acting by three mechanism of actions. We have decreased aqueous formation, we have got increased aqueous outflow also and plus we are also having the increased venous, episcleral venous pressure. There is a very important side effect of this drug and that is your vortex keratopathy or the cornea verticillata. All right. Now, those of you uh, uh, have already been uh, maintained on these drugs, that's not a problem. But suppose uh, the patient is not controlled, then what we can do? Then the second is that we can go for the laser trabeculoplasty then we can go for the laser trabeculoplasty and laser trabeculoplasty we can do with the argon laser or um, the diode laser or we can use the frequency doubled frequency doubled nd yag laser right so basically it is causing the collagen shrinkage and increasing the aqueous outflow its mechanism of action is increasing the aqueous outflow and this is the treatment of choice for the fellow eye. When we are using it for the profile excess, this is actually the treatment of choice. Now, those who have even failed this, then we can do finally the third resort and that is your trabeculectomy. Then we can do the trabeculectomy. In the trabeculectomy, we actually create a fistula which is an abnormal communication between the anterior chamber and the subconjunctival space. Now what happens? The bleb that we are creating right the uh, bleb we are creating and so that it does not get fibrosed we can even use two drugs here we can use the metomycin c and we can also use 5 fluorouracil so these are the drugs we can use otherwise we can also go for the sit on surgery now let us try to see what is this uh, sit on surgery in the sit on surgery this uh, question was also asked in the NEET 2019 that what is actually sit on surgery here we are placing the glaucoma shunts so if we are placing the glaucoma shunts in the bleb which is created then there are lesser chances of fibrosis and aqueous humor will continue to drain. So this is called a sit-on surgery. Can you see here? This is the um, shunt that we have placed and this is coming from the anterior chamber to the uh, subconjunctival space. Now we have got different kind of uh, shunts available like for example this is your Ahmed glaucoma valve. This is the Ahmed glaucoma valve and uh, this was first used in India. The Ahmed glaucoma valve that was first used in India. Then we have got one more. This is called as express mini shunt. This is made up of stainless steel. This is made up of stainless steel. Now we will start with the angle closure glaucoma. 
Now, uh, what I told you that basically there is a closure of the angle of anterior chamber. So, what can be the important risk factors because so many times is a question on the risk factors. So, can you see here? there is a narrowing of the angle of anterior chamber. Normally, uh, the normal open angle is your 45 degree. Your 45 degree instead of this become, this has become 20 degree. So, this is a very, very important risk factor. You can uh, see it with the help of anterior segment OCT. You can also see it with the help of the UBM and obviously gonioscopy you can do, but you can, we are not able to quantify. So, what are the important risk factors that we are getting? We are getting the small eyeball, then we have small cornea, it is not flat cornea, small cornea, small eyeball, small cornea, then we have got this that is your uh, shallow anterior chamber which is found in hypermetropes. So, hypermetropes have more chances of angle closure glaucoma while myelopes were having more chances of the open angle kind of glaucoma. Then this is more common in females more than 50 years of age along with the type A personality. So, all these are the risk factors and risk factors are always asked. Now, if you see that uh, how we can analyze that this is actually a narrow or a shallow anterior chamber. So, for this we can see the eclipse sign. What is this eclipse sign? See, if I am showing the light from the temporal side and the anterior chamber is normal, then I will not see any shadow. Can you see there is no shadow? But if the angle of anterior chamber is very, very narrow, right, then I will get a very fine crescentic shadow there. This crescentic shadow means that there is a narrowing in the angle of anterior chamber and this is called as the eclipse sign. All right, now look at the main precipitator of this attack. So, if you see the attack of the primary angle closure glaucoma, it usually comes due to the mid dilatation of the pupil. Mid dilatation of the pupil can be due to the rainy season or it can be due to the dim light, due to the dim light or it can be due to the emotional stress. If there is a emotional stress or emotional stimulus, it can also be due to any dark room procedure, if we are doing any dark room procedure or it can be due to the pharmacological madrasses. Pharmacological madrasses, if you have given any drugs for the dilatation may be due to the retinoscopy. Now, why there is an attack due to the mid dilatation of the pupil? Because the dilatation of the pupil leads to a very important sign and that is called as the iris bombay formation. So, basically there is an iris bombay formation due to the mid dilatation of the pupil which will lead to the acute congestive glaucoma. Acute congestive glaucoma leads to the peripheral anterior synecy and peripheral anterior synecy leads to the chronic congestive glaucoma. So, this is how all the stages are going to happen in the case of angle closure glaucoma. Alright, now let us start with the stages. When there is a starting of this angle closure glaucoma, the first and the second stage that we get is your latent stage and then we have the intermittent stage. So, in these stages when we have the latent stage or the intermittent stage, what is the treatment of choice that we are giving? The treatment of choice is the laser iridotomy or the peripheral iridectomy. Can you see here? This is your laser iridotomy and this is your peripheral iridectomy. Peripheral iridectomy is your surgical iridectomy and the first choice is your laser iridotomy. 
here again I will be using the ND YAG laser that is your 1064 nanometer. All right. Now these are the two stages. What if it increases? If it increases, then it reaches to the third stage that is called as acute congestive glaucoma. Then it reaches to the acute congestive glaucoma. Now, acute congestive glaucoma is important because this is again a ophthalmic emergency. This is again a ophthalmic emergency a very very important conditions where we have got a very high very high intraocular pressure we have got stony hard eye stony hard it is acute red eye okay so how does the eye look like can you see we have got acute red eye the type of congestion is called as Circum corneal congestion. Circum corneal congestion. While this is your conjunctival congestion. So, in order to show you the difference, I have kept both the pictures. This is your conjunctival congestion. So, can you see this limbal area is free here, while this is mainly present in this limbal area, right? Then what is the other thing that you are getting? You are getting the hazy cornea, compensated hazy cornea. Then we are getting the mid dilated pupil, mid dilated pupil which is also fixed. So there are so many things that you are getting here. We have got hazy cornea, circumcellary congestion, acute red eye, vertically oval. This is also vertically oval vertically oval mid dilated pupil it is also fixed non reacting it is also fixed so if this is a phthalmic emergency where the drug of choice a very important thing what is the drug of choice the drug of choice is the pilocarpine pilocarpine is the drug of choice because it is a meiotic and what kind of meiotic it is even this was asked as a question, its mechanism of action is the active meiosis. This was a, a question that was asked in DNB 2018. Now, though the pilocarpine is a drug of choice, but it is not given immediately. The first drugs that we are giving are either the acetazolamide, the first drugs are acetazolamide or we will give the IV mannitol. So, we are not using the pilocarpine because you know we require the muscles activity to be normal for the section of the pilocarpine and at such a high congestion what will happen there will be the sphincteric, sphincteric spasm. So, pilocarpine will not be able to act. Now, very, very important is the contraindications of the pilocarpine. There are certain things which it is causing. You can call it as rather adverse reactions. So, what are the adverse reactions of the pilocarpine? It can cause the iris cyst. Then it can cause the anterior subcapsular cataract anterior subcapsular cataract and also it can cause the spasm of the ciliary muscle which can induce the myopia. So, very very important it is AIA. We have the uh, anterior subcapsular cataract, we have got I4, I resist and then we have accommodative spasm which can cause the induced myopia. All right. Now, see here what is this? This I showed you in lens also. So, these are actually called as the colored halos. 
these are the colored halos and uh, you know that colored halos are found in the cataract they are found in the ca uh, acute congestive glaucoma and also the acute mucopurulin conjunctivitis so they are asking they are found in all except so what will be the answer the answer will be the corneal opacity it is not found in corneal opacity now how will you differentiate whether it is due to cataract or it whether it is due to glaucoma so this test is called as the Finchim's, Finchim's stenopic slit test. Finchim's stenopic slit test. Now let's see how it is working. Here the patient is asked through to look through a stenopic slit. Okay. Now what will happen if the colored halos are breaking? If they are breaking, they are scattering. So, this scattering is due to the cataract. This is the scattering which is occurring in the cataract. While if they are intact, if they are intact, that means it is due to the acute congestive glaucoma. So, this will be very helpful in differentiating whether the colored halos are due to the cataract or due to the glaucoma. Now, see the question here. This test is used to differentiate. This is the test. So, you know this is the Finchim stenopic slit test. So, this is used to differentiate what? So, answer will be acute congestive glaucoma and the cataract. Then, see this. This is the um, anterior segment examination which is showing you a very uh, important thing can you see this is your uh, iris here and uh, iris ballooning is taking place this is your iris ballooning right so when there is a lot of iris ballooning what will happen this iris ballooning will lead to the iris bombay formation and iris bombay formation will lead to the acute congestive glaucoma acute congestive glaucoma there will be sudden closure of the angle of anterior chamber and this will lead to the synecy this is your peripheral anterior synecy and once the synecy are formed between the cornea and the iris there will be chronic congestive glaucoma chronic congestive glaucoma so this chronic congestive glaucoma will be your stage number four after the acute congestive glaucoma we have chronic congestive glaucoma can you see this is the picture which is showing you the iris bombay formation right so what will be the treatment of choice in the chronic congestive glaucoma we have got treatment of choice that is trabeculectomy. You have to perform the surgery because you know once the synecy are formed, the meiotic as well as me won't help. Then finally, we are coming to the stage number 4 uh, that is your 5th. This is called as absolute glaucoma. Absolute glaucoma. So, what you are getting in this absolute glaucoma, we are having the painful blind eye. Painful blind eye is present, right? So, what is the treatment of choice here? In the treatment, uh, we can do either the laser photocoagulation or we can do the cryo or we can do the diathermy. And if they are not working, then simply we can go for the enucleation. Then we are going for the enucleation, right? Now we will see some of the important secondary glaucomas. Secondary glaucomas, right? Now see the first one. Can you see the vessels over the iris? This is rubiosis iridis. And rubiosis iridis can lead to the neovascular glaucoma. And uh, neovascular glaucoma, we have got two important things here. The most common cause is the PDA, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And another important thing is that it is also found in CRVO. It is also found in CRVO, but uh, 
it is not the most common cause here in crvo also we get but it is not the most common cause but this glaucoma is called as the 100 day glaucoma that is why it is important this was also asked as a direct question in your neat 2018 100 day glaucoma right then coming to the next can you see here we have got the pigments on the posterior surface of the cornea these are the krukenberg spindles these are found in the pigmentary glaucoma pigmentary glaucoma krukenberg spindles and what are these these are actually the pigments on the posterior surface of the cornea pigments on the posterior surface of the cornea krukenberg spindles now in this pigmentary glaucoma we also get one thing and that is called as the Sempaulazy's line. So, what is this? This is your Sempaulazy's line, right? This is actually uh, Sempaulazy's line. If you see, this is a gonioscopic finding. Gonioscopic finding where you are getting the pigments along the shawl base line pigments along the shawl base line now there is another secondary glaucoma this is called as your pseudo is this visible yes it is a pseudo exfoliation pseudo exfoliation syndrome in this pseudo exfoliation syndrome we have got uh, the dandruff like material we have got the dandruff like material which is there in the anterior segment right and due to which again we will have the secondary open angle glaucoma let us see this this is again your pseudo exfoliation syndrome can you see this is lot of dandruff like material which is present here then see this now here in the UBM you are able to see a very important thing what is this this is anteriorly rotated ciliary processes which leads to the misdirection misdirection of the ciliary processes so due to the misdirection of the ciliary processes also there is an important secondary glaucoma that can take place that is called as ciliary block glaucoma also called as malignant glaucoma or the inverse glaucoma now let me tell you an important thing about here why it is called as the inverse glaucoma because here the treatment of choice is the atropine to break the cilio lenticular block so basically in order to open the cilio lenticular block we are using the atropine that is why it is also called as inverse glaucoma thank you